Hey everybody, what's going on? Welcome to my channel. This is Brad being chill. Today I want to talk about the new M1 chip that Apple just announced at the Apple Silicon event and the performance numbers that they mentioned on stage and how they line up with what's on their website and how they arrived at those numbers. Now before we get into that, I do want to ask if you're not already to please subscribe to my channel. I upload new videos every week, Monday through Friday, so if you like this content, make sure you subscribe and click that bell so you can stay up to date on all the latest tech news with me. Now let's get into it. So some of you guys might notice that this video is a little bit different from normal, and that's because I'm reading off my iPad simply because I want to make sure that the numbers are accurate since I won't be able to memorize all of them. And I want to get this video out to you guys as quickly as possible. I am going to put up some graphics on the screen to help you follow along, so hopefully it's not too boring. But let me know down in the comments if there's anything you think I can improve on, and I'll do my best to do so before the next video. So the M1 Mac models are available for pre-order right now on Apple's website. So if you are interested, you can log on and go ahead and pre-order them so they don't sell out before you get one. And they should start shipping sometime next week, likely arriving around November 17th. And Big Sur is also going to be coming out this Thursday, so if you're looking forward to that, make sure you log on later this week and download that so you don't miss out on it. Now, Apple has stated that this M1 chip is the first 5 nanometer chip in a personal computer. However, I know Huawei also has a 5 nanometer chip in their phones, so I imagine it's only a matter of time before they slap one in one of their computers as well, since they have a history of copying Apple. This M1 chip also has 16 billion transistors, and it's going to have 3.9 times faster video processing and 3.5 times faster CPU performance inside of a M1 MacBook Air when compared to a 1.2 gigahertz quad core i7 MacBook Air with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a two terabyte SSD. Now there's also gonna be 7.1 times faster image processing with the M1 Mac Mini when compared to the 3.6 gigahertz quad core i3 Mac Mini with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a two terabyte SSD. Now it is interesting that they are comparing it to the i3 and it is something to keep note of here. Now that there's no longer multiple processors to choose from on these devices, I do think it's very interesting they've chosen to compare it here to the i3 and not the i7. So I'm very curious to see what the benchmarks are gonna come out whenever people start getting these in their hands. The M1 SoC or system on chip does have an eight core CPU inside of it. And Apple is even saying that this is the world's fastest single CPU core. So I'm very interested to see if that's true. These are definitely some bold statements and I really hope they can back it up. However, I am gonna remain skeptical until these start shipping out next week and we see some real live tests on them. However, what's more interesting about these CPUs is that they actually have four high performance cores that maximize performance, and they also have four high efficiency cores that use one tenth of the power of the other cores, and they're gonna run lighter tasks to save battery on your device. And this is definitely an interesting design choice, and I'm not sure if we've seen this in other CPUs before, but it definitely shows that maybe they're working around some kind of limitations, or if this truly is the future of CPUs and how they should be done in order to have a more portable form factor where power usage is a concern. They do have a graph up on Apple's website where it has CPU performance versus power of the M1, and they are saying that it has two times faster CPU performance while only consuming 25% of the power inside of a M1 13-inch MacBook Pro with 16 gigabytes of RAM compared to the multi-threaded performance of a latest generation high performance notebook. They do not specify which notebook it is or what the specs are, only that they have compared them and found a comparable option. However, as we all know, there's not really any comparable laptops out there to a MacBook Pro, so it is interesting that they have not listed what it was exactly. I'm sure they did it for legal reasons, However, the inner skeptic in me says that maybe that they don't want to let you know what they were comparing it up against, similar to the i3 Mac Mini I mentioned previously. Now, Apple has made another bold claim, and I could see this one being true more so than maybe some of the other ones. However, they have stated that these CPUs have the world's best CPU performance per watt, and they're stating with a graph that they have three times higher performance per watt with an M1 13-inch MacBook Pro 16 gigabytes of RAM compared to previous generation Mac notebooks. Now it is very interesting to me that they have chosen not to list a specific model of Mac notebook and it leaves a lot of room for ambiguity and is very weird to see, especially considering that they were so open about what they were comparing the other stats with before. So do keep that in mind when you're looking at these stats. However, I do think that the battery life will be better than the previous generation MacBook Air, at least by a couple of hours. So if that's all you need, and really most people probably do only need that because they're not gonna be using this laptop all day since they sleep for eight hours a day, and I imagine it will be just fine for most people. 
The M1 SoC also has integrated graphics, and Apple, of course, wants to have another world's best, so they're stating that they have the world's fastest integrated graphics in a personal computer. Now, I do believe this one simply because the Intel integrated graphics have always been crap, in my opinion, and I think everyone will probably agree with that. So I imagine this is probably the easiest department for Apple to step up and beat them in. Now, they do have some graphs here, and they do state that this is an 8-core GPU with 25,000 concurrent threads, and that it has two times faster GPU performance while using only 33% of the power with an M1 13-inch MacBook Pro with 16 gigabytes of RAM compared to latest generation high-performance notebooks commercially available. So once again, we have some ambiguity here. However, I think that this is definitely a department Apple can win in and simply the integrated graphics that Intel has to offer are not gonna compete at all. The reason that I think these chips are gonna blow the Intel integrated graphics right out of the water is simply because the A14 chip in the iPhone and the iPads are already way better integrated graphics performance than their Intel counterparts. And I imagine the M1 SoC's GPU is gonna be even better. And so Intel's not even gonna stand a chance. However, I do want you to keep in mind here that these are not dedicated GPUs and I don't think they're gonna perform as well as a 5500M or a 5600M that you can currently get in a 16 inch MacBook Pro. So don't expect them to outperform that. However, I am very curious to see what Apple decides to do next year when they release the 16 inch MacBook Pro with an Apple Silicon chip inside of it. If they're gonna make their own GPU or if they're not gonna include one or if they're gonna leave an AMD GPU on it like they have in the past. We have to wait and find out, but that is one interesting thing to consider. Now, moving on to the machine learning side of this chip, Apple loves to bring up the fact that this has a better machine learning performance, even though not many people probably even understand it or know what it means. I probably don't even completely understand it, and I don't think many people out there are even using it to their full advantage, but I think they like to throw out these fancy numbers just so people think, wow, even better, even better, even better every time they say a new number. So this new chip is going to have a 16-core neural engine on it, and it is capable of performing 11 trillion operations per second, and they're stating that it has 15 times faster machine learning performance with an M1 Mac Mini with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 2 terabyte SSD versus a 3.6 gigahertz quad-core i3 Mac Mini. Once again, notice the i3 and notice that it's a Mac Mini, which hasn't had a refresh in quite some time. So I imagine this comparison is really not even worth it considering the machine learning performance on such an older device, of course, is going to be worse. So I don't really think many people need it. The machine learning thing they did bring up during the event is that it can improve the way your webcam works. And of course, there's some other features as well, but I don't really think this is a major consideration point for most people when they're deciding to buy these devices. Now, another thing they mentioned during the event was that the M1 SoC has a secure enclave on it, which I guess is just some hardware that they have to make your Mac the most secure Mac ever, like they say every year. However, I don't really think unless you have nuclear missile codes or something illegal on your device, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Yes, encrypting your files is good. However, when somebody steals your Mac, when was the last time that they got past your login screen or even ripped the hard drive out of your device? And even if they did, by the time they did that, you would probably already change your bank account information or whatever anyway. So I don't think that's a big deal and that's probably why they've chosen not to talk about it on their website. But it is an additional feature nonetheless on these SOCs. One thing I thought was interesting was in this keynote they elected to talk about battery life. Whereas with the iPhone 12 keynote they didn't even mention it a single time. And I think that's because unlike the iPhone 12, this new Mac lineup actually has a better battery life than its predecessors. That's why they chose to talk about it. So the MacBook Pro 13 inch with an M1 chip does have 17 hours of web browsing and 20 hours of movie playback. And the MacBook Air with an M1 chip has 15 hours of web browsing and 18 hours of movie playback. So you're definitely getting a couple hours there and you're approaching the territory where you're not gonna be able to use it in a single day, even if you were sitting on it nonstop. And I think that's the perfect place for them to stop improving the battery life and if it can last a single day, even counting in some degradation. However, the harder you use these devices, it will last a lot less longer. So keep that in mind and don't expect it to always get these advertised rates when you're doing more intensive tasks. Now, perhaps the most interesting part of the new Apple Silicon Max is the RAM. They do have a new UMA or unified memory architecture where you can have eight to 16 gigabytes of high bandwidth, low latency memory that all of the hardware on the M1 SoC can access without having to copy between multiple pools of memory, which they say can improve performance and battery efficiency. Now, I imagine it must be quite fast 
if they've chosen to remove the 32 gigabyte and 64 gigabyte options that were available on the previous Mac models. And I think a lot of people, maybe power users especially, are gonna be kind of skeptical to go with this lower memory option since it seems like that would be contradictory towards buying a device that's gonna be future-proof. And I know a lot of people bought either 32 gigabytes or even 64 gigabytes on their 16-inch MacBook Pros simply because they wanted the device to last longer. And unfortunately, with the release of Apple Silicon, those Intel MacBooks maybe aren't gonna last as long as they thought they would. Another important thing I wanna point out is that due to this new UMA, I don't think the Mac Mini is gonna have user upgradable RAM anymore. And that is gonna be a big kicker to a lot of people simply because it was way cheaper to upgrade the RAM yourself. And it is going to be weird seeing that these are now locked to 16 gigabytes of RAM as a maximum choice. Now, of course, Apple has built macOS Big Sur to take full advantage of this new M1 SoC. And now systems with M1 can wake instantly and supposedly apps are gonna launch nearly instantaneously. However, you know, don't wait up on that. I think that there are gonna be apps that developers don't optimize very well that maybe don't launch instantly like they say they will, especially games. They're saying that games are gonna launch instantly and maybe the window is gonna open, but I doubt it's gonna load very fast, but I'd love to be wrong about that. Now, Safari is also gonna be smoother. System animations are gonna be snappier, yada, yada, yada faster processor, snappy animations, blah, blah, blah. I'm pretty sure my Intel Mac can be plenty snappy enough with the animations, but I imagine they're not gonna push that out to older MacBooks. They also have hardware verified secure boot and automatic high performance encryption for your files and new security protocols to make your Mac more secure. But as I said earlier, I don't really know what you people are storing. Please let me know down in the comments all the sensitive information you don't want people to steal from your computer because I'd love to see why you need to be so secure. Obviously, it's better than not having it, but as a bragging point, I think it's very interesting. But they are going for this privacy thing, and while I do appreciate them blocking ads from getting all of my personal data, I would like to see them do a better job of that in the future and maybe put Google back in its place. So probably the biggest advantage of having Apple Silicon inside your Mac is gonna be the ability to load iPhone and iPad apps directly on your Mac now by downloading them from the Mac store. And it only takes developers a few minutes to code them to be able to work on your Mac. Now, I don't think a lot of these apps are gonna be very well optimized like Apple claims they will be. And I don't think that the mouse and keyboard interaction is gonna be very good on some of these apps that are expecting you to be touching your screen, but we'll see if they adapt. And I think developers will maybe try to take advantage of this untapped market simply because the Mac App Store has been kind of lackluster ever since its inception. Very similar to the Windows 10 Store, which nobody really cares about, except to download Minecraft, which is really the only reason most people probably go on it. Now, there will be universal apps in the Mac App Store, which have code bases specifically for ARM and Intel chips, and they will be able to be downloaded on all of your Macs without any issue. However, they are stating that Logic Pro can run up to three times more instrument and effect plugins and rendering a complex timeline is now up to six times faster in Final Cut Pro when you're comparing a M1 Mac Mini with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a two terabyte of SSD with a 3.6 gigahertz quad core i3 Mac Mini with Intel Iris UHD Graphics 630. So of course, right off the bat, that's a very specific thing to say about Logic Pro and I don't really know what that all means and I imagine that's probably not a very reliable benchmark. And then as far as the Final Cut Pro being six times faster than the other Mac Mini, obviously it's gonna perform way better than the baked in integrated graphics on the Intel chip. So I don't really think this is much of a comparison. And even though that's the comparison, I'm surprised it's only six times faster considering. Additionally, for apps that aren't gonna support ARM natively, Apple does have Rosetta 2, which is gonna allow you to have a translation environment that lets you run the Intel apps on your MacBook with the ARM chip inside of it. And this is likely gonna cause some slowdowns and maybe some bugs. So Apple has stated this is not a permanent solution and developers should not be using this to avoid having to code a new ARM version of their app, but simply to use it as a crutch to kind of get there while they're developing the newer app. And so I wouldn't expect this to last forever, but Apple is definitely gonna to need to use it for the meantime, simply because there is not a lot of apps available on these Macs right now, and there's going to be some growing pains while developers start to catch up. And while we're on that subject, perhaps the most interesting thing that I thought about this whole event was the fact that Adobe doesn't even have Lightroom ready for next month, 
and this is going to be the first Adobe app available on these new ARM Macs, and then they're going to have Photoshop the month after that. So you're talking about not even having a date for Premiere Pro yet, and Lightroom isn't coming till next month. They don't have anything ready right now, and Adobe products are the main reason people are going to be using these devices, and using Premiere Pro is going to be one of the biggest incentives for people to buy these devices. So I imagine Adobe needs to step up here, and I'm really surprised that Apple let them get away with this and not have it ready at the launch date with all of their applications. However, obviously it takes some time to optimize all that code and transfer it over to a new code base, but I think this is gonna be a big pain point for a lot of people, and that's gonna prevent a lot of people from buying these Macs until they see maybe the whole creative cloud that they're already paying for is gonna be moved over, simply because they don't wanna lose out on the performance since editing 4K or even 8K footage on an Intel-based Mac is already hard enough, but taking a 20 to 30% performance increase hit from Rosetta 2 is going to be even worse. So people aren't gonna to wanna to buy these Macs right away until Adobe kinda of gets their stuff together. And I hope they do that very quickly. But with Adobe, I am skeptical. They are not very reliable in the past. So we'll have to wait and see how long it takes them. That's all I've got for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Like I said, it was a ton of numbers and it was hard to get through. But if you did learn something, make sure you smash that like button. And let me know down in the comments if you're buying an Apple Silicon Mac or if you're gonna wait or anything that you might think about what I just said in this video. Now, once again, I do upload new videos every week, Monday through Friday. So if you like this content, make sure you subscribe and click that bell and you can stay up to date on all the latest tech news with me. Now I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.